Hello and welcome, I am Arumba, thank you for joining me. This is a one episode guide to how to play Novgorod in the current version of the game. This is Cradle of Civilization 1.23. So, you want to play Novgorod and you want to know how to play uh, against Muscovy, who will almost certainly kill you if you uh, don't make the right opening moves. Well, I have a very straightforward approach that you can use that uh, will win and succeed about 95% of the time in my experience. And so, let's just go through the, uh, the motions of, of how that works. So, uh, as Novgorod, you have a very interesting government type called the Vechi Republic, which allows you to do interesting things like raise Streltsy, uh, support Opreknina, and also reform Sudabnik, but you can't do any of that stuff if you don't beat Muscovy. The problem is that Muscovy has two separate ways that he will normally end up attacking you. One is he has a core on your province of Velsk, and the other is that he will very likely take a mission that gives him claims on pretty much your entire country. Uh, the problem is that you, you can't win against him. Uh, you can't beat him in a straight-up fight, because he's got five subjects. Muscovy starts off with, uh, Peskov, Yaroslav, Perm, Beluzaru, and Rostov as minions, each of these bringing three to eight thousand troops to the party, in addition to his own army. So, there's just nothing you can do to actually beat him head-to-head. -head. You're also in a very weak position as far as potential allies. Pretty much everyone that borders you hates your guts. In this in this example, I've uh, spawned in with a rival, um, an enemy Denmark, Lithuania, the Livonians, Muscovy, Tver, like anyone that's independent that could be my ally um, absolutely hates me. Uh, that's not what I meant to do. We wanted to actually check and see who would accept an alliance. So we have Scotland, completely useless, Ryazan, and Odiev as potential allies. Here's the thing. I'm going to show you how to beat Muscovy with no allies at all. First thing that we're going to want to do uh, and this is a good trade way, uh, a trade thing to do in the first place. We're going to release Velsk as a, uh, a trading city. And the main reason for that is that we want to reduce the likelihood that Muscovy can declare war on us within the first month or two. Uh, he could use the Reconquest CB to immediately get to war with us before we can get into position. We would prefer for him to actually take the mission to, to get claims on our entire country, because we want to slow him down and buy time so that we can actually build up our strength and get some strong allies. So we're going to create a trading city here. Uh, basically, we're giving up three development to, to, to buy a little bit of time. Now, we don't want Velsk to actually be part of our first war with Muscovy, and if Muscovy decides to attack Velsk, we'll probably just let him have it. We don't actually want to defend this guy, even though he is now part of our trade empire. Uh, we could do quite a bit of other stuff, like try to invite people into our trade league. Uh, these are secondary things as far as the goal goes. Uh, for the purposes of this video, we would, if possible, like to sell our heavies to somebody, since, honestly, there's really no reason to have heavies. Um, you know, if I could find a couple people who will buy them, I'll sell them. If not, then that's fine. But let's go about speed three or so. And, of course, Muscovy's going to immediately start doing some stuff that we don't like. We're going to go ahead and counter-rival Muscovy. We're going to establish our other rivals as well, probably the Livonian Order and maybe Tver. Go ahead and get our troops to protect trade in Novgorod. Now, as far as merchant placement goes, uh, the game starts you off collecting trade in the White Sea, and we have a fairly sizable advantage in this trade node. The problem is that if you collect from two separate trade nodes, you lose all transfer trade bonus in your primary node. So by collecting here, we can collect maybe a ducat, but if we don't collect there, we miss out on that ducat in favor of getting a potentially 20, 30, 40, etc. percent multiplier on our trade power in Novgorod. This is a, it's incredibly important as Novgorod because we are a republic. We have the ability to increase goods produced based on the percentage of the trade zone that we own. Uh, so we have 36% control right now that increases goods produced by a percentage. Um, we have 20.7% increased uh, production from trade companies. Well, nearby merchant republics, trade cities, or trade companies. So, we want to continue to have a larger and larger percentage in this province, or this, this trade zone. We don't necessarily care about the White Sea trade income. One thing you can also do is, early on, if you pick up, say, Theodoro, as a member of your trade league, and then ask them for fleet basing, this will allow you to send a merchant down into, potentially, Astrakhan, and you can steer money away from the, the Ottomans. So, that's something we'll try to do if we have the, uh, the ability to get it done. We're going to decline any alliance offers right now, but you don't want to actually want to have any of these people. They are a liability. Hey, that's actually kind of a good thing. Lithuania stopped being a rival, because they're now in a union underneath Poland. Wouldn't be a bad idea to try to improve relations with Poland. A lot of times they will potentially be your first major ally. 
So the first thing we're going to do against Muscovy is we are going to embargo them. The reason for that is we want to encourage Muscovy to embargo us. And if we are rivaling him and we embargo him, he will almost 100% embargo us as well, so long as there's no truce, which there is not. Okay, we can create a state. We don't really care about that too much. Lithuania is no longer a great power. That is fine. We have lost the trade conflict CB against Muscovy, and that is because he has likely... or has not yet... When will he do it? We should see the embargo coming in very soon. We also should be able to see him picking out his mission in a moment. Sometime within the first few months. Alright, so here's an example. Uh, let's take a look at our income from trade. We're currently making 4.88 ducats. We're getting only 0.68 ducats by collecting in the North Sea. Uh, to me, that's not really worth it. So instead, we're going to bring that merchant from the North the White Sea back to Novgorod or rather to another location like, say, uh, let's see, we only have the three merchants. We got one over here, one in the White Sea, one in Kiev. We want to collect from trade with a guy who is currently in the White Sea. So last month, trade income was 4.88. Should be, if it's not better, it's going to be close enough that in the long term, we're going to want to keep it. We lost like 0.6 ducats in that trade, in that trade. But as we continue to get more and more trade power in this region, we're going to want that extra percentage multiplier here. Okay, so we are now embargoed by Muscovy. Now, this is the, this is the crazy thing. What we're going to do now is we're going to revoke the embargo. And we're going to wait one more month. And this is where you might find this to be a bit crazy. Uh, but this is, this is, again, this is like 95% of the time this works out as a safe opening move against Muscovy. Now, because he has us rivaled, he will keep the embargo active because he hates us. Um, he might, if he's maybe somewhat concerned about the balance of powers between us, revoke the embargo because he's afraid of the, the Cassis Belly that we could use. But here's the thing. If we wait, I can promise you sometime within the next year to two years, he will attack using a Cassis Belly, which will give him ticking war score for occupying any one of our bordering provinces. This means we lose 100% chance. If we try to declare an offensive war using Reconquest, again, it's a territorial thing. There's no way we can guarantee we hold land. And the reason why we did the embargo unembargo is because of this. The war goal is to show superiority. We get a bonus war score from winning battles. If we get more than 10% war score from battles, we get a ticking war score. This is the one way that we can guarantee we control when and where the war score is generated. So we're going to declare a trade dispute. And again, the only way you can declare this is if there's a one-way embargo. We did that by embargoing him, then revoking the embargo. So we actually are going to go on the offensive. We're going to declare war on Muscovy right now. And then we're going to put a leader in charge. We don't even really need one, but let's go ahead and take our, uh, our ruler. Who actually turned out to be pretty good. And we're going to go and we're going to smash Skov. This is what's beautiful about the fort placement that Novgorod has at the start of the game. And the positioning of Peskov on the far west side of Muscovy. He has one subject that will continuously train small, small armies that we get to beat up on. And we have two forts, one in Novgorod, one in Lucky. This means that we have a nice little safe area in here between Neva, Ingermanlin, and Kolm that we can kind of bounce between and maneuver around the, all these little armies. Be prepared for the entire northern half of your country to get occupied. Be prepared to potentially go up a little bit in war score. Or, or sorry, uh, uh, war exhaustion. It doesn't really matter. Don't worry about it too much. Go ahead and mothball that heavy before I forget. And then one thing that you'd want to look for, um, if you can, Morale of Armies guy would be great. I would actually say that the best possible military advisor you could hire would be the Fort Defense Advisor. But uh, if we can't get that, then that's, that's fine. It's not a big deal either way. You don't need it. So we want to immediately get this first battle in. We don't care about terrain, we don't we just go fight him wherever you can get him before he can go merge with everybody else. And we're hoping for a quick little stack wipe. Gives us 3.94 war score. One of the things that's beautiful about this cast of spelly is that it enhances the war score you get from battles. Even killing a one stack can give you up to three war score. All we really need to do is get above 10 so the ticking war score can do its job, and then we allow for the Russian winter to do the rest of the damage. 
So next, we're basically just going to hang out in our own lands in a safe location. And what we're looking for is zooming closely in on these provinces, there's going to be a little man who's going to be hammering on a blacksmith, indicating that a troop is being trained. When we see that, we want to time it so that our army arrives just in time, there he is right there, to murder that army. So let's go hang out in Lucky while we wait for this infantry to be fielded in uh, Ostrov. Now again, don't worry about all of the horrible, horrible things that Muscovy's going to do to the rest of your country. We will become occupied very, very quickly. Alright, so we got a guy popping out on the 27th and on the 26th. We just want to sit here and kind of wait until we know that we will arrive. Even though it says that the troop will pop out on the 26th, it doesn't actually pop out until the 27th. So if you're trying to time it just perfectly, make sure you arrive two days after the day that it shows. And this is where having a uh, defense advisor would help. It would slow down every individual siege of all these provinces. Um, but if we can't get that, then that's fine. Another thing you could consider would be if you were to consecrate Metropolitan in your capital. If there's any chance you get a lucky event, maybe you could turn on the... Uh, I believe one of these edicts might give some some sort of advantage. Manpower recovery, discipline, that could be useful. But again, not 100% necessary. Alright, so this guy's popping out on the 26th. We can be there right now on the 12th. We'll try to time it so that we arrive on, say, the... May the 1st, actually. I, I would prefer to avoid suffering any attrition whatsoever. So let's try to arrive... If we arrive on the 1st, we'll actually suffer attrition. So let's arrive on the 2nd of May. And then we'll path through Peskov up to Ingermanland. And our country starts to get occupied now. Now watch this. A 1 stack, because we have more than 10 to 1 ratio, we'll just get overrun, and we instantly get 3.3 .3 war score. Move on to the next province. Again, no losses suffered on our side, 3.3 .3 war score. We suddenly have 10 war score, and beginning next month, we're going to start getting a ticking war score against Muscovy. The rest of our country will fall. That is fine. Muscovy's enthusiasm is very, very high right now. They have a much, much larger army. It, it, look, it appears to be a suicidal war declaration. But that's not going to be the case. July the 3rd, June 25th. Now one thing you can do if you're really concerned about um, how much maneuverability you need to have is I would recommend I'm going to park the army down in like say Lucky, but on our way through Colm we're going to scorch the earth. Somehow we're going to burn down the snow. We're going to do it preemptively because we don't know exactly how aggressive Muscovy's going to be or if he's going to get lucky with his siege sticks. What this does is it reduces their ability to move through Colm by 50%. So if it took them, say, two weeks to get there, it'll increase that time by 50%, up to three weeks, potentially even more. Um, and if they have low maneuverability, then they could take potentially a month or two to arrive one province adjacent. Also, we do have this faction we could mess with, but that doesn't really matter too much. Sure, we'll take some mercantilism. Oh, hey, look, rebels. Rebels are a good thing. If you get any events whatsoever that allow you to spawn rebels in your country, fire them. Because what will end up happening is the enemy will treat them as if they are your soldiers and they will go and engage them directly. You can actually, in some cases, not, not as Novgorod because we don't have estates, but you can, you can fire estate uh, disasters and events to just throw problems in their way. Watch as Muscovy or his subjects go and fight this Novgorodian rebel stack over here. But meanwhile, Muscovy is suffering some damage. Not a huge amount, but some. There's another troop that's just popped out. This guy pops out on the July the 3rd. Let's make sure we don't arrive too fast. Okay, perfect. And we will just probably... Tell you what, we'll go here, here, and then back down to Lucky. And there was our ticking war score there for a moment. We are losing war score from the occupations, but don't worry about that. Another three war score for that murder. He sees what we're doing. Three war score there. Instead, we're gonna... Okay, yep, he stopped again. And that's why we scorched that province. He he wanted to come reinforce, but he couldn't actually get there in time, so he just kind of broke his siege. If he had already breached the walls, he would have just given that up. Back down to Lucky. I would I would almost even consider, if, you're, if you want to really take this, this strategy to the extreme, before you declare your war, send Peskov a gift of 25 or 50 ducats, so that he has enough money to keep on training these one stacks. The longer he trains them, the more direct war score you can get. So far, we're at 17 war score from battles. And then when we look in here, Muscovy's already suffered 1,800 casualties due to attrition. And 3,800 due to fighting those rebels. 
The northern half of our country, as I mentioned, is dying. Don't worry about it. It's fine. 25th of August. And is he training another troop there? He should be. He is not. So this is where he's run out of cash and he can no longer afford to train another man. And while you're at war, you can't actually send him money. That's why you have to consider doing it if you're going to do it before the war is declared. And once again, he just broke the siege because he saw that there would be a battle. Look how long it takes him. It takes him 14 days to move one province. We should be safe here in Ingermanland for now. And this is what we want to see. Muscovy and all of his minions are going to start piling massive numbers of troops onto these provinces. And here comes the Russian winter to aid us. Great thing about scorching provinces in between forts is that even though it will end up costing us extra movement speed to move there, if they occupy it, since it takes so much effort to siege down Lucky and our capital, if they break the siege for whatever reason, the zone of control will recontrol Kolm, and we don't have to worry about marching very slowly into that province. Okay, we got another stack coming in from here. But because of the fort placement, we should be nice and safe. And that is a 2% attrition tick, not too bad. That stack appeals to me. I'd like to try to pick that off in Ladoga if we could. I'll head over to Neva. See if maybe the timing works out right, that we could swipe that one stack. We have a four stack arriving on the 3rd of November, followed by a one stack. Uh, actually, the one stack arrives first. Only one of the two armies is locked. Let's see if just threatening to go there changes things. Yes, so now Muscovy Society doesn't want to actually come here. We'll go pick off this other one stack for another three war score, and then double back. Anytime there's a battle, they're going to be like, Oh gosh, we got to go fight that guy! And look at this beautiful 5% attrition on 36,000, 37,000 troops. We'll go to our safe point over here in Ingermanland again. And let's go ahead and do speed 4 while we just wait a little bit. I'm going to try to avoid doing any more little pickoffs because they can be a little bit risky. But, um... Main thing we want to do now is just let some time pass. Okay, so anytime you see this happen, like, uh-oh, I might be caught, never worry, never, never be afraid to just scorch the earth. Again, this is a province adjacent to one of our forts. It's gonna harm the, uh, the devastation of the province, but we don't care. We just want to survive the opening game. And it's going to make him run around, suffering massive amounts of attrition, trying to get to an army that he'll never be able to reach. Okay. Even though the vast majority of our country is occupied, we still have positive 10 war score. He's still at 55 enthusiasm, but he thinks we're making gains based on the fact that it's a trade dispute uh, Cassus Belli. We're making gains on the war goal, which is the percentage of one battles, or the battles won over 10% war score. So let's just again, speed four, hopefully uh, I don't have to worry about maneuvering around too much. This army should hopefully move into the capital and then throw a little obstacle into the Novgorodian army. Or not. We've got a small stack trying to march this way. Okay, we will scorch. And if it's not going to be enough, let's see, we've got... A 13 stack arriving in Neva on the 6th. Can't quite get out this way. Or that way. But we can safely go this way. Now, ideally, we don't want to abandon this little safe zone in here. But if we're going to get caught, we have to leave. And because of that fort, even though he could go through it because of some weird zone of control pathing, he'll just have to back up again. And we're going to time it so that we will arrive now behind him and then go back into Ingermanland again if we can. We're just going to keep on bouncing around in this region, waiting. And here's what I was talking about. See how Colm is already being reverted? 
Next time he tries to go there, he's going to do the same thing he did last time. He'll pile a huge army, suffer massive attrition trying to get to it, and end up just taking more attrition than he really should. This army is arriving in Neva. It's a three stack. Depending on how many other troops are following, we might try to go and engage that. But in general, we, we don't really need to engage much of any of them. And my guess is that this army is going to go to Neva and then either try to hit us in Ingermanland or du just double back again. And there's another stack there. We'll take a 12 stack. Go stack wipe the one. He saw the potential battle, pulls as many troops off of there as he can, and watch this next beautiful, massive attrition tick. Ingermanland is back under control, we're at 16 war score, down to 50 enthusiasm. Eventually these nobles should path onto the capital, which will just end up getting uh, thrown into the meat grinder of the Novgardian troops. We could try to go up and pick up that Beluzaru stack. Back to speed 4 and let some stuff happen. Okay, he breached down here, that's unfortunate, but if Lucky falls, that's not the end of the world. Now our goal, the actual result we're looking for, is to get him to concede defeat. Because of the fact that we used a trade dispute cast a spell, it's only 75% cost for monetary reparations, concession of defeat, and chance of trade power. Which means instead of the normal 10 war score that you require to make demands, you only need 8. We're only 40 reasons away from him accepting Surrender. What this does is gives us 20 prestige, makes him lose 20 prestige, and gives us about a 6 year truce. In those 6 years, we can peace out and potentially get an alliance with Poland or anybody else. Maybe Great Horde, Kazan, no guy, Somebody that will help offset the power against him. Worst case scenario, if that doesn't work and you can't pick up an alliance, you just do this again and again and again, over and over until you have 60, 70, 80 prestige to his negative 50. By then, you'll have enough morale of armies from having a massive morale uh, advantage due to the prestige effects that you can actually beat him in a straight up war. Now with this cast of spell, you can't demand any land, but the most penalizing thing you could do if you were to succeed would be to demand trade power. Because now not only do you have him weakened on morale and prestige, but now you start to cripple his finances. Not to mention, if we look at the ledger and we take a look at his actual army size, he is already down to no manpower. And how many battles have I had against him? Not one. We've done absolutely nothing to Muscovy whatsoever. He has suffered already 8,000 troop death to, due to uh, attrition. We just wait. And look, another one stack heading into Biskov on the 17th. And there is a Ryazani army following behind it. Let's wait till this army is locked. And then we'll swipe that one. Notice how there's this massive flurry of activity as I... Try to path into there. It looks like I may have mistimed it, though. We arrive on the 22nd, 29th. Another one of the armies did arrive in time. So this could be a bad battle, but it did break all of the sieges, including the breached walls of Lucky. So if we have to, we fight for 12 days. Nice roll there, buddy. Very nice rolls. Impressive. Very nice. Okay. We just have to go a little bit longer. And then we will just retreat one province over again. So that was a really unfortunate effect, but it did break the Siege of Lucky. And that also raised his enthusiasm, because now he thinks he's doing a good job. So I should have been a little bit more cautious there, but I think you can still see the, the idea behind the strategy. Let's see if we can wait a little bit longer. I'd like to at least get to the point where we can get him to peace out. Because he has no mora no uh, morale manpower at all, he's starting to see his troops get so much attrition that they, uh, they're they weakened, and we could potentially pick off a good fight against him. It's possible, if you get really lucky and you can just fight Muscovy's army and not his subjects, that you might even drive the subjects to become disloyal. But it's, it's very difficult to do, and not a guarantee. Currently at uh, negative reasons to demand. You have to have, you do have to have 10 war score to make the demands, but having a very inexpensive demand um, is very good. We're back up to 9 war score despite that one bad battle.
Okay, that army is looking potentially like something we could kill. It's far enough away from the other troops, and it is mostly Muscovite, a mostly Muscovite army, which means it harms him the most. So yeah, while these guys are all heading off up to uh, who knows where, these rebels spawning is not uncommon. I don't want you to think like that's part of the, the reason why this is working. You're very likely to have rebels spawn as your war exhaustion goes up anyway, and just very likely to have some random event cause them. Wow, they actually got lucky and got that siege. That's, uh, that's surprising. Back we go then. Okay, they've broken that siege there. So that's that's really unfortunate that they actually got that fort. Based on that happen happening, I would be probably aiming for just the white piece now. White piece is not nearly as good as the concession of defeat because of the, the morale of army swing and the prestige loss. But it happens, so what can we do? We got lucky with a wall breach and then just got lucky with a dice roll and it is what it is. Still suffering some pretty massive amounts of attrition. Look at the, the troop death. We've lost 4,000 to 41,000. Even though I've made that one mistaken fight. I'm gonna go ahead and scorch. Uh, we already scorched Neva. So despite that occupation, we do still have the ticking war score. If we wait long enough, we can probably get our white piece. And we want to keep on putting our army nearby to bait him into chasing it around. The longer he's chasing it around, stacking up, trying to, to actually put together a combat stack, uh, and potentially um, suffering full 5% attrition on the entirety of his forces, the better. And look, they just had a disease outbreak in Novgorod, couldn't maintain the siege, broke the siege, and are now trying to engage this army, which is, for some reason, suiciding its way into me. All right, so you'll arrive on the... Then we could be through on the 9th. We have a small army, a perm, that we'll get there before then. That's fine, actually. We'll take the, the fight against the weaker two-stack if it wants to engage. Waiting for this entire massive army to arrive in Ingermanland and then try to chase me a little bit further. There's another, another massive attrition tick coming in, most likely, right here. So if it weren't for that one fort falling, we would have another 15 war score right now. We'd be at 17 war score, which would most likely be enough to have the peace deal. Highest priority stacks to pick off, if, if you can see them, are the one stack Muscovite army. is going in there and these guys are all just hanging out right now not sure where they want to go 41,000 troops 48,000 troops and BAM 5% of 48,000 that's a pretty big number Muscovy's at 3.2 war exhaustion uh, his desire for peace is still still positive because of that unfortunate fort falling again if we could have hired the uh, defensive the fort defense guy that is even less likely to have happened And finally, he is actually going for the uh, rebels, like I said he would. We'll spread out a little bit, see if we can siege down some of these holdings, get them back under our control, and have him continue the process of marching around doing absolutely nothing. And Novgorod here is actually taking Kolm back for me, which is great.
Very weakened uh, stack from Muscovy. Let's see where this army's headed. Muscovy's going north. I uh, I would actually consider engaging the Muscovite army right now. It's got 10 in the front row. It would be a painful fight, but I think we could win it. And if we do, it's directly against him. Which means that he will pick up War Exhaustion and he will lose his own personal strength of armies. Which means he might actually be willing to accept the peace deal right now. Main thing we need to do is just get his loyal his uh, enthusiasm down to a good number. Below 20. We'll take that fight. We're the defender. We did not roll very well in the first phase. We have a pretty darn good leader, which is unexpected and not really necessary. I'd say if we if I hadn't lost the, the fort and lucky, we would, wouldn't even need to do this fight. But because we did, I'm kind of adjusting slightly. And we got a massive 7.7 .7 war score. Barely lost any men. And uh, we can get out of there. And so that is not quite going to be enough, I think. But we're within 13 reasons of a potential peace deal now. So anyway, uh, this video is going a little bit longer than I expected. I just wanted to show you the the way that you could open out, open up against Muscovy. And uh, you know, I had hoped that I could actually peace out in this video. But I do want to keep this somewhat short, somewhat reasonable, so people don't get scared by the length of the video. But I hope that you can see that from here, even though he's got this massive numeric advantage, it doesn't really matter. The numbers mean nothing when he can't actually get to our army. He's already lost 60,000 troops, 10 to 1 ratio, and it's going to continue to get worse and worse. In fact, he's going to start murking, murking up, which he already has, which is going to start putting him into uh, a position where he has to take out loans, and when that happens, he'll be even less interested in being in the war. So, anyway, let me know what your thoughts are. Uh, I've, I've used this to great success in, in a number of different campaigns. I absolutely love playing in the Russian winter region. I think it's fantastically fun. So... Uh, let me know what your thoughts are. If you have success with this, please please do mention it. Uh, tell me how, how much fun it was for you to play as Novgorod and to beat the Muscovite at their own Russian winter game. This is uh, probably one of the most fun things you can do to abuse the AI in its uh, miraculously poor planning and the way that it marches its armies around. So, cool. As always, thank you for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next video.